And here we are for part two of this wonderful series. Um, all right, so let's get right into this. Um, so we had talked about what the definite integral is, and it's the equal to the area between f of x and the x-axis. Notice here it specifically says only when f of x is greater than or equal to zero. So the question then becomes, well, what happens when f of x isn't positive? What happens when f of x is negative? For instance, let's take a look at this right here. So when f of x is equal to negative x, so here's my function, negative x. And this time when I go from 0 to 4, now my area is below the x-axis. I want to find the area geometrically. Again, my area, area is always positive. So I find this is a triangle. I have 4 this way, 4 this way. So my area is equal to 1 half base times height, which is equal to 8. Now, the problem is that's my area. My integral, as I said earlier, is different. My integral represents a number, a numeric value that we're going to, to associate with. In this case, my numeric value is, I'm going to say, is negative. So when I want to represent this integral from 0 to 4 of negative x dx, this is going to equal negative 8. It is the negative area. It has a negative, so it's like saying, some people say this is negative area. No. Area is always positive. This just happens to be the integral value is negative. Okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. It says here just what I said. So when f of x is less than 0, the area equals the negative integral. Because the integral value itself is negative, so the area is going to be positive. So now the question becomes, well, what happens when I have something that does this? And I have some areas above, some areas below, more areas above. How do I find that area or that integral value? Huh. Well, let's see and talk about some more. So when f of x is positive for some x values and negative for others, then my integral value for that section a to b is the total area above the x-axis minus the area below the x-axis. Again, notice area is always positive, so I will be subtracting. Okay. So they want me to sketch a nonlinear function that meets these conditions. So what I want you to do is I want you to do that. Sketch me a nonlinear condition labeling the area region above the x-axis as A1 and the area below the x-axis as A2. And then I want you to evaluate it in terms of area 1 and area 2. Okay. I'm going to pause the video and see what you guys get. Draw me the sketch. But bam there it is. Now our drawings can be different as far as what's happening there, okay? But this part right here should be the same no matter what you drew. Okay? All right. Let's go see what's next. So now let's go ahead and take a look at this one. I want to evaluate this one geometrically. All right? So, I'll do this one with you. I'm going to go ahead and graph this, 1 minus x. So my graph starts up here at 1. There's 1. I'm going from 0 to 3. Okay, so here's my sketch. Here's my area. Here's this area. So again, 
my area of this triangle is 1 times 1 divided by 2. So my positive area is 1 half. So I can figure it in this A1 is equal to 1 half. A2 is equal to 1 half of this distance, which is 2. Okay, and this distance, which is also 2, which is equal to 2. So my areas are the same. Now, but my integral value is my integral value of 0 to 3, 1 minus x dx is equal to my positive area minus my negative area, my not negative area, minus the area underneath the curve. Okay, so 1 half minus a 2 is equal to a negative 1 and a half. And that's my integral value. Pretty cool, all right? You found an exact area underneath there? I'm good. All right, so let's see here. What's next? Okay. So on this one here, this one here says begin together. Okay, uh, I'll do a couple on each one. And um, you'll do one, you'll do a couple, you'll do one, and we'll see how this goes. If you should notice, there are three slides that are coming up. They're exactly the same. This one and two more just like it are exactly the same. I did that for a reason so that you'd have, it, it wouldn't get too messy. All right. So the one fact that they do give us in this little exploration is that this right here, the integral from 0 to pi of sine x is equal to 2. So now we have to sit down here and give an argument of these, find these integral values based off of what we know about sine x and what we know about the intervals of sine x. And so those intervals, so let's take a look here. Number one. First off, let's go ahead and show what they have here from zero to pi. That means that this area right here, that is two. And so now what they're saying is, hey, what's this area? So for number one, they're asking for the integral from zero to pi, not zero to pi, excuse me, pi to 2 pi of sine x dx. They want to know this area down in here. Well, shoot. I should know that the, what happens on the positive side is exactly the same as what happens on the negative side. Okay. So if this is going to be a positive 2 here for this integral value, this integral value is going to be a negative 2 because it's below the x-axis, and these areas are the same. So I'm going to say that that's going to be negative 2. All right, so now knowing what I have here for number 2, okay, now I have a 0 to 2 pi of sine x dx. Now I want to work myself through that one here too. So now I'm going from 0 to 2 pi. So now I have this being a positive 2 and this being a negative 2. So what is that going to do? Huh. Positive 2, negative 2. Better be 0. Last but not least, I'm going to let you do number 3. I'm going to go from 0 to pi over 2. Sine x dx. So think about it. I'm going to pause it. It shouldn't take too long, right? And boom, there it is, right? Should have got one. It's half the distance. It represents half my curve. So it's half of the <laughs> unit circle. It's all half of everything, so it better be half the area as well. All right. Let's go and take a look. So now I'm going to go to the second slide for this. So when you hit, see this, it all clears away. And again, I have the same fact, but now I want to do number four. And now you have to go back to your transformations. I'm still going from zero to pi. But what's happening? What's happening to 2 plus sine x? So this is your transformation time. When I do 2 plus sine x, I'm raising my whole graph up by 2. So now what my graph looks like is here I am now at 2. 
and my height's going up to 3, and the low's going down here to 1. And now my graph is doing. Oops, let's try that again. Now it's doing something like this. And they went from 0 to pi. So they want this same business right here. There's pi. So I know what this shaded region is, right? I know what that shaded region is. It's the same as the shaded region from before that was 2. So, but now I want to add this. Well, how could I possibly add that? It's a rectangle. So I'm going from 0 to 2 times pi. So my rectangle is 2 times pi, or 2 pi. That's that area. Plus, I'm adding in the 2 I already know. And there is that answer there. Okay. Number 5. Okay. This one here, I'm doubling. Okay. I'm doubling up. Now what's happening with number five? Five, now I'm doubling. Okay. It's going from zero to pi. It's now two sine of theta or x. So again, what has happened to that one? Well now my graph goes up to two and comes back down. So again, what happens here is all my x or y values are increasing. So when they're increasing, or not increasing, but stretching and being doubling, so everything doubled. All my heights doubled. My width stayed the same. So again, think of it like a rectangle. If my rectangle was, my width stayed the same as a rectangle, but my height doubled, how does that affect the area of the rectangle? Hopefully you can see that that doubles the area. So this will double the area. So what was 2 now becomes 4. Okay, Number 6. Let's take a talk about number 6. You have to remember what does an x to the minus 2 on the inside do transformationally for your, for your graph? What does it do? This is where you have to remember again back to pre-cal and algebra 2. Oh. When I change something in the x, it's bizarro world. What looks like it should go left, this is actually a shift to the right. And when I make a shift to the right like that, notice my ends here. Look. My, my integration limits, okay, limits of integration also changed. It also shifted to the day 2. This is the same thing as 0 adding 2 to the right, pi adding 2 to the right. So everything shifted 2 over. So if everything shifted 2 over, my area is going to be the same and therefore equals 2. Okay? And so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the third one. And we'll go over here to the third one. So go to the third slide. I think. And I want to we're gonna pause the video real fast. You're going to do number seven. And we'll see what we get. Pause. Boom. There it is. All right. I'm not going to explain a lot about those. That one should be fairly straightforward. Again, number eight. I'm going to give you a little bit of help. And I'm going to pause the video again. And I want to see what you come up with. Okay. So... You gotta remember, what does this do to my graph? What does my graph look like now? Again, remember, changing something in the x is bizarro world, okay? And what bizarro world does, right, is instead of what you would think would be a shrink, this is actually stretches it out. So what was from zero to pi now goes from zero to two pi. Okay, so there's the graph. I want you to, I'm going to pause the video and again, think about it. And think about specifically number five. How did I explain number five? And see if that can help you out with number eight. And boom, there it is. Okay, should be four. 
Again, the same type of concept. Well, what happened? My height this time stayed the same, but my width changed. So again, if I had a rectangle to where my height stayed the same, but my width okay, doubled, how would that affect my area? It would double it. Finally, number nine. Okay, graph it. You remember what cosine of x looks like. So again, what does the graph look like? Well, here's my graph, right? It starts up here at 1, okay? And then it does one of these. Oops, that was too much. There's pi. There's my graph. It wants to know what the integral part of this is. So you have to think to yourself, self, what might it be? And if you're thinking zero, you are correct. Zero. So what I want you guys to do here is I want you guys to think about number 10. And I'm not going to pause the video. And I just want to see what people are thinking about it. Uh, leave your comment behind about number 10. I'll see what people think. All right. Great. We're going to go on here to number next up. Here are all my different examples. All right, so we're only going to worry about 24 and 28 on this. So on 24, now they're not giving me exact numbers anymore. So what can I possibly do? So draw it out. I'm going from 0 to, to some letter b. I don't know. My function x is equal to 4x. Well, to find my area, I need to know what this height is. Because I know what this is. This length is b. This height, okay, well, what is it? When I plug b in, in there, this point is b comma 4b. So there's my height. So my area for this, or my integral value from 0 to b, 4x dx, is equal to 1 half base times height. And when I simplify that, it's 2b squared or not to be squared. You make the decision. Laugh now. All right, finally, number 28. Again, what am I doing? I need to draw this out. I need to see what's happening. Here's x. f of x equals x. I'm going from, oh, not 0 now. I'm going from some letter a to some square root of 3a. So now I need to put my distances. I need to figure out what all this is. Again, if you tilt your head sideways, you should see a trapezoid. So what's an area of a trapezoid? Okay. Is the base 1, which is this height here, which is going to be a. Why? Because this point is a comma a. This point up here is square root of 3a comma square root of 3a. So this height is a, this base is square root of 3a. And so what is my area is a plus square root of 3a all over 2 times my height, which is square root of 3a minus a. And when I go ahead, I can multiply this out, foil it out. What I'm going to end up getting is 3a squared minus an a squared all over 2, which is really equal to 2a squared over 2, or just a squared, which is kind of a fun answer. Okay. I'm hoping this gets you there, because here comes your assignment. All right. Not as long this time. Okay, only 19 minutes. A little bit shorter. We'll see you guys next time.